The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. We are all, by any practical definition of the words, foolproof and incapable of error. There is a problem we have to discuss. It pertains to something that has the potential to affect every one of our lives, regardless of political affiliation, religion, or ethnic background. The thing I'm talking about is technology, but not just any type of technology. I'm talking about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is the technology behind everything from self-driving cars to military drones. Last week, a new documentary premiered that focuses on both the benefits and the dangers of AI. Google and Facebook et al. have built businesses on giving us, as a society, free stuff. But it's a Faustian bargain. They're extracting something from us in exchange. But it does strike right at the issue of how much we should trust these machines. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, or deep learning all refer to the same thing. They simply refer to the way computers are increasingly becoming programmed in order to carry out tasks. But in order to understand the issues that surround this type of new programming, it's very important that you understand the way computers have always been programmed. At the most basic level, a computer is just a tool. However, unlike other tools, computers speak a language known as binary, which consists of ones and zeros, and so different programming languages are created in order to write code or instructions that tell a computer what to do. When you hit a key on a computer, there is a line of code that's been written to tell it to do that. When you open a document on your laptop, there is a specific line of code that's been written to instruct it to do that as well. The only types of errors that can creep in into this type of programming are called coding errors, and they can be traced back to the specific line of code that was written for that function and most crucially, can be corrected as well. Artificial intelligence, on the other hand, takes a completely different approach to computer programming. In essence, what we're trying to do is mimic human intelligence, and to be specific, we're trying to mimic the learning and experience gathering that human beings are innately born with. This is what promises to have a technology-driven future in which we have self-driving cars, we can find cures to complicated diseases such as cancer, and we can also make predictive models of the future, all based off of the data that is fed into these artificial intelligence models. What then is the issue? Bias is the issue here. I'm an algorithmic bias researcher based at MIT, and I've conducted studies that show some of the largest recorded racial and skin type biases in AI systems sold by companies like IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon. You've already heard facial recognition and related technologies have some flaws. In one test I ran, Amazon recognition even failed on the face of Oprah Winfrey, labeling her male. While the word bias may seem like such a mundane word that it makes it really hard to understand its implication in the development of artificial intelligence, it cannot be stressed enough how, if left unregulated, artificial intelligence could become the worst invention created by mankind. And that is by no means an understatement. So remember how I said computers have always used coding to essentially be told what to do? The amazing thing about this is if a coding error is found, it can easily be fixed or replaced with better code. And while this type of coding has essentially been the driving force behind the 21st century, it completely pales in comparison to what artificial intelligence can do. Artificial intelligence works by utilizing mountains of data to train computer models on how to detect things like faces and other types of objects. This is what gives your iPhone its ability to detect your face and enable Face ID while denying other people access to it. Unlike lines of code, Artificial intelligence can only be measured by its inputs, or the data you put in, and its outputs, that is, the results that are made based off of those data sets. Simply put, artificial intelligence is a black box to even those that, do, that are developing it, meaning they understand the data that's being fed to it and can analyze the results, but have completely no clue as to how the computer came up with those results. The issue of bias comes into play when we review the types of datasets that are being used to train these computer models. And when we look at those datasets, we realize that majority of them contain majority men and lighter skinned faces, which make them unfamiliar with darker skinned faces. 
a study on facial recognition technology, a subsection of machine learning, said that while the motivations for FRTs can be well intended, these systems can propagate harmful discrimination, invade privacy, and rely on problematic data practices. Furthermore, there's a dangerous perception that these technologies are neutral and hence should be given more authority than human decision makers because they involve decisions made by machines. But recent research shows that gender, racial, and skin color biases can be propagated by commercial FRTs. Okay, so that's a lot of jargon and you might still be thinking, so what? So let's take a step back and analyze this on a bigger picture. There are currently nine companies that are building the future of AI, and those include Facebook, Amazon, Apple, IBM, Google, Microsoft, Tencent, Alibaba, and Baidu. Six of those companies are American, and the other three are Chinese. Of the six that are American, most of them have one thing in common. Yes, white men. And this is a trend you notice even in academia, the higher up you go. You have less diversity and less representation, in which you have a small homogeneous group of people that are at the helm of developing these future technologies and defining how those technologies interact within society without any sort of regulation. But the problem is we all have biases, and unfortunately those biases can be embedded in technology. So let's see how influential some of these companies can be in society. So what kind of influence and power do these companies possess? Well, in 2010, Facebook decided to run a simple experiment on 61 million of its almost 2.1 billion active Facebook users. Now, if you know anything about statistics and research, you'll understand that 61 million is a huge data set. The experiment presented its users with one of two notifications. You either saw it's an election day text, or you saw the same text, but with little thumbnails of profile pictures of people you were friends with. This message was only shown once and without anybody's consent or knowledge. And from that simple experiment, Facebook was able to move 300,000 people to vote. And 300,000 doesn't really seem like much until you realize that the 2016 election was decided by an estimate of about 100,000 people. And so with just one simple message, Facebook was able to turn out three times the number of people that decided the 2016 election. The chilling part about all of this is we only know about the experiment because Facebook decided to publish the experiment and its findings. And so that's just one simple example of a powerful technology that's being run by a few. And this technology can also be used to determine things like your credit worthiness, such as in the case of Apple. Apple, for all its forward-thinking approach to privacy, does not fare well either when it comes to discrimination practices as a result of using AI technology, because these technologies can also be sexist. In November of 2019, Apple launched its Apple Card in its usual sleek and beautiful form design. Now, this is straight from Apple's website on how your credit card application is evaluated. It says, Goldman Sachs uses your credit score, your credit report, including your current debt obligations, and the income you report on your application when reviewing your Apple Card application. However, when multiple joint couples who shared debt, assets, and income equally applied, women were less likely to be approved for the credit card, and even when approved were more likely to be given a lower credit limit than their male spouses. And this was the case with Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak. In a tweet in response to David Hansen, he said, The Apple Card is such a sexist program. My wife and I filed joint tax returns, live in a community property state, and have been married for a long time. Yet Apple's black box algorithm thinks I deserve 20 times the credit limit she does. No appeals work. Steve Wozniak tweeted, The same thing happened to us. I got 10 times the credit limit. We have no separate bank or credit card accounts or any separate assets. Hard to get a human for a correction though. It's big tech in 2019. Adding on to this, David Hansen also tweeted, So let's recap here. Apple offers a credit card that bases its credit assessment on a black box algorithm that six different reps across Apple and Goldman Sachs have no visibility into. Even several layers of management, an internal investigation. It's just the algorithm. Out of all these examples, Amazon has to be the most prolific example as to how this biased technology can falter when deployed into critical parts of society. So Amazon decided that it was going to use AI software to sort through resumes. Now this AI software did not just toss out a few resumes, 
it completely declined and rejected any resumes that were from women or any woman-centric resume. And so to recap here, you have very little diversity in powerful tech jobs. You have few women that work in this industry and you have even fewer women of color. And now you have an AI driven model that was created by a specific group of people which is rejecting any applications that it deems female. Amazon also happens to be the largest company that's working on facial recognition technology, a technology that has been proven to be based off of faulty data and also produces inaccurate results. And yet that same technology is already being used around the country in police forces and courts with no regulation whatsoever, a technology that is known to produce wrongful identifications. I think when people imagine a mass surveillance state, they look at a country like China where every citizen knowingly lives under a constant state surveillance, where a social credit score determines whether you'll be allowed to use public transportation or be able to buy groceries, and we think to ourselves, that can never happen here, right? And yet there are over 117 million people in the US with their face in a facial recognition network that can be searched by police unwarranted using AI software that has not been audited for accuracy. And without oversight, without regulation, you can easily create a mass surveillance state with the tools that exist. And with where we are now in the US, this use does not need to be made public, because there are no rules that govern the use of these technologies. There is a very important point in history that is very rarely spoken about, and is only known to history buffs and enthusiasts alike, which is important to outline the difference between computer and man. In 1983, at the height of the Cold War, the US and the Soviet Union have reached what is known as mutual assured destruction. This is a term that describes a situation where two countries' offensive powers are enough to overcome each other's defensive measures. In an early warning station sits Stanislav Petrov, a Russian military officer who has been tasked to monitor this early warning system that would alert him if the US were to launch a nuclear strike towards the Soviet Union. These alarms had never gone off until one night they did, and so Stanislav, knowing that he only had a few moments to react to these alarms or face complete annihilation at the hands of the US nuclear strikes, decides to do nothing. His gut feeling tells him something isn't right, something feels wrong, and so he sits and waits until nothing happens. You see, this kind of response can only be expected from a human and no amount of computer technology can properly simulate this type of response, especially with the type of unregulated development that we currently have. It was later found out that the US had actually never fired any nuclear strikes towards the Soviet Union, and that high altitude clouds were to blame for the false alarms. World War III evaded. Modern society sits at the intersection of two crucial questions. What does it mean when artificial intelligence is increasingly governing our liberties? And what are the consequences for the people AI is biased against? The issues of racial, gender, and economic inequalities will not only be preserved, but be amplified. Without oversight, without regulation, without scrutiny at every level of development of these technologies to ensure equal representation across the human spectrum, these biases have the power to reenact injustices we have long fought to overcome. And with that, I leave you with this quote to ponder upon. Who controls the past controls the future. And who controls the present controls the past. We should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Um, if I were to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. So we need to be very careful with artificial intelligence. I'm increasingly inclined to think that there should be some uh, regulatory oversight uh, at the inter at maybe at the national and international level uh, just to make sure that uh, we don't do something very foolish. Um, I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. Hell 9000 would be easy. <laughs> it's way more complex than, I mean, it would put Hell 9000 to shame. Yeah, that's like a puppy dog. <laughs> this mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. So if you made it to the end of the video, thank you so much for following along. I have gone ahead and shared links to the research studies and book I read in preparation of this video. 
Also, if you have a keen enough eye, you might have noticed the hairstyle change towards the end of the video and hopefully that gives you an idea into how long it takes to uh, research, shoot and prepare one of these videos. And so if you enjoyed it, let me know by liking, sharing and subscribing to watch more content like this in the near future. See you in the next video.